Precision medicine, is it hype or help, fact or fiction? Welcome to Precision Insight. This is a podcast series where the most influential thought leaders and innovators in healthcare sit with me to chat about the latest technologies and tools of precision medicine. If you want to know more about this incredibly fast moving field of research and development, stay tuned. With me today, I've got Liam Brunham. Um, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Columbia, principal investigator on the UB Center, UBC Center for Heart and Lung Innovation. He's a practicing physician at the Health Heart Program Prevention Clinic at St. Paul's Hospital, one of the largest specialty lipid clinics in Canada. In addition, he's a Canadian Institute uh, of Health Research new investigator and a Michael Smith Foundation Health Research Scholar, and in 2017 was recognized as one of Canada's top 40 under 40. That's an incredible uh, series of achievements, and, and I'd like to know, first of all, how you did it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, first of all, th thanks for uh, the opportunity to be here, uh, Martin. I think, um, you know, I, I feel that I've been very uh, fortunate to have some excellent mentors along my, um, my um, you know, career uh, pathway. So I, I did my PhD with um, uh, uh, a physician scientist named Michael Hayden, who some of your your viewer, your listeners may uh, be familiar with a very prominent uh, geneticist uh, and really expert in the field. And and I think um, you know having a solid foundation training with someone who can really um, teach you how to ask scientific questions, um, how to conduct science, how to communicate science has been uh, very important for me in terms of um, you know building now my independent research program, which I've really just begun over the last um, three years since since I started as an assistant professor at UBC. Yeah, I mean, I think that having a mentor is absolutely critical. Uh, mine was uh, Professor Muir Gray from the UK, who is an epidemiologist and, and really determined with me the path to um, academic work. So yeah, I think we're both lucky in having the support of uh, a person who can give time generously um, to help your own career develop. Um, and in, in terms of the focus of your direction in going into uh, personalized medicine, what, what, what took you there? Well, I think my, my main scientific interest has always been in genetics. Um, I actually started out my, my undergraduate program in engineering uh, because in high school we had these career counselors who'd an engineer because that's what was needed in the future. Um, and then, uh, so I had never actually taken any biology, um, but in my first year I read a book by David Suzuki which was describing the principles of genetics and I just found it so much more fascinating than anything that I was doing um, in school um, that, I, that I ended up switching into a genetics program. I, I, I spent um, the summers working in a genetics lab and um, and that's really been an interest that that's kind of carried through um, you know since then, uh, and is still very strong. And then I think through my clinical training, you know, I've really um, tried to identify areas where I could combine um, the problems that I and gaps that I see in terms of providing care to our patients with um, you know all these amazing developments that we've had in, in genetics and in, in terms of our ability to sequence genomes to analyze uh, 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 genetic data to understand gene function and thinking about how we can use those tools to really improve patient care. So it's really been a great um, sort of marriage of, uh, you know, my, my interest in genetics and, and my role as a, as a physician, I think that's led me um, to, to the precision medicine space. So you sound actually quite excited about precision medicine. Do you see, I mean, how do you see it playing out in medicine? Well, you know, I think unfortunately it's become such a such a buzzword that it's 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 kind of lost most of its meaning now. You yeah. know, as as tends to happen, everyone does precision medicine these days. So, um, you know, for many people, precision medicine just means what uh, you know genetics meant, you know, yeah. five or ten years ago. So, um, but I, but I do think there's really amazing opportunities where we can start. To, and and I mean, I think. What's, what's astonishing to me is that, you know, we know so much about genetics, about the genetic basis for disease. We have these tools for identifying genetic variation, and yet we, 
for for the most part, we don't really use them in in clinical medicine. And so, you know, in my area of medicine, where I where I practice in a lipid clinic, many of the patients we see have inherited um, lipid disorders, and mm-hmm. and in fact, we've known about that for a long time. But actually, our, our our implementation of doing genetic testing to actually confirm the diagnosis provide more, um, you know, a molecular diagnosis that could lead to more appropriate counseling and in some cases even change treatment is, is really just in its infancy. And so that's, that's an area that I'm very excited about because I think there's a, a huge opportunity for us to actually implement some of the knowledge we already have um, in, in a way that, that will actually be beneficial for patients. And then, of course, there's everything that we still need to learn in terms of all the, all the unknowns. Interesting you say that we're just at the beginning because that's that's the feeling as well, uh, I think, on the ground, that, that while there's a lot of talk about genetics, uh, and the, the paradigm sort of is that we've actually been using genetics for a very long time. We've been doing uh, testing for uh, fetal abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities for quite a while, but that's been in distinct areas of medicine. It's not been the whole of medicine. Um, mm-hmm. and I think Absolutely. The challenge is, is sort of how do you put so much more new information into a clinical situation where we're very time pressed? Uh, how, how do we actually then move that forward? So we're using it for not only lipids or uh, for antenatal testing, but just about everything. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And obviously there's been some areas of medicine that, that are really um, you know, much further along. I mean, pediatrics, newborn screening, yeah. disorders of metabolism. I think in HIV, they've actually been very, very um, far ahead of the curve in terms of implementing some of these technologies. But yeah, how do we do it sort of across the board uh, really poses huge challenges. I mean, you know, a- as you know, even just in our ecosystem in British Columbia, we can't even get on the same electronic medical record <laughs> together. So, how, so when you think about now how you try to incorporate, you know, these much more complex types of data, how you build that into um, you know, decision support tools that will actually aid the clinician and not just provide difficult to understand information to a clinician. I think there's there's certainly many many challenges um, on on the implementation side that we're that we've that we've yet to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. And so coming down to your own work, you're 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 using something called pluripotent cells. What's a pluripotent cell? <laughs> How would I recognize one? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so this has actually been an amazing uh, discovery. That's uh, that's really only um, uh, 12 years old. So so an in, the in, induced pluripotent stem cells were discovered by um, a Japanese uh, physician scientist. Actually, he was an orthopedic surgeon, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, in 2006, and he, and he soon after won the Nobel Prize for that discovery. And this is essentially the was the um, you know we have this traditional view of development that you start off with an undifferentiated cell that has the ability to turn into any any of the specialized cell types in the body. And over the course of development, it becomes more and more specialized and essentially loses the ability to differentiate into other cell types. And so that a terminally differentiated cell type, you know, a bone cell or a skin cell, um, it's, it's, it's that type of cell type, but has lost the ability to turn into any other type of cell. What Yamanaka discovered is actually by um, by introducing four specific genes into a terminally differentiated cell, like a skin cell, you can actually turn the clock back, as it were, and and change that cell into a more uh, a more primitive uh, st- uh, state, uh, what he called an induced pluripotent stem cell, which, which um, regained the ability to um, differentiate into any of the specialized cell types of the body. And so um, how do we use that technology? Well, f- well, for one, just in terms of our ability to, to use stem cells to model disease, this provided this whole new source of stem cells. Obviously, there's been issues in some jurisdictions about the use of em- human embryonic stem cells. So this provided this new opportunity to generate stem cells in a way that bypassed those ethical concerns. But from a from a, a therapeutic or regenerative medicine. So one of the um, really exciting applications of these cells is that um, because they're genetically identical to the patient from which they were obtained, if I take a blood cell 
you know, from, from you and turn it into an induced pluripotent stem cell, we then have the ability to generate cell types that are, have the same identical genome to you. So we could generate new heart cells, new liver cells, new brain cells. And so you can imagine the potential applications from a, from a therapeutic perspective. That sounds fantastic. I mean, and are you working in the uh, development of new heart cells area? Is that what your field is? Yeah, so we, we are using it not so much from a regenerative medicine perspective, but we're actually using um, um, it more in, in, the, in what's called the disease modeling space. But our take on it is a little bit different. So we have a very strong interest in, uh, as, as I know you do, in pharmacogenomics and in understanding the, the inherited basis for adverse drug reactions. And so the way that we are using these induced pluripotent stem cells is we generate these cells from patients that have had a serious adverse drug reaction, and we're particularly interested in drug reactions that affect the heart cells. And then we, we generate heart cells that are genetically identical to the patient. And then we can study in the lab how those cells respond to the drug in question, how they might have responded to a different drug, how, they, how their response would change if we alter um, certain genetic variables within the cell, which we can do in a very precise way. And so we, we believe that it gives us a new um, sort of in vitro model system uh, in which we might be able to predict how, how a human being would respond to a certain medication. That actually sounds fantastic because at the moment, uh, what we've got to go on is big genome-wide association studies where we may need to study 10,000 people um, to identify which genetic variants might uh, result in an adverse drug reaction that is, is rare but serious. So now you're, you have developed a method for maybe shining the light on the mechanism and then backtracking to saying, potentially there might be a, a genetic variant that we could screen for before giving a person this drug. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think one of the issues that we've struggled with is, you know, there's been great progress in, under, in identifying genetic variants that predispose to adverse drug reactions, but the genetics is complex. And I mean, even in the best of circumstances, there might be a variant that's present in you know, say 30% of people that have the adverse drug reaction and maybe only 1% of people that didn't. So that would be a very strong association. But then there's still 70% of the people that develop the adverse drug reaction that, that didn't have that genetic risk factor. And so um, how do we identify those patients? And so we think the, the IPS, induced pluripotent stem cell model, might be one way in which uh, even if you don't know all of the genetic variables involved, you might still be able to understand something about, about the patient's um, uh, susceptibility to, to a specific adverse drug reaction. Absolutely. I mean, this sounds, uh, this sounds like a very complementary way because presumably with the genome-wide association data being collected in, in groups like Genome England and their big projects, you can take your findings and uh, test them against the real data. Is that the sort of area you might yeah. be Exactly, and then I think the the other, and then also in the other direction, because these um, groups that are identifying genetic variants that are linked to specific adverse drug reactions, we can actually test um, their their function in a very controlled way in this type of system by introducing that genetic variant and then comparing in cells that have or don't have that variant, and so we can we can really um, get down to what the what the sort of mechanistic underpinning of those associations are. Absolutely fantastic. So we've we've got to keep both areas of research going because I think so. <laughs> complement each other. I mean, there is a lot of uh, not resistance, but there's a lot of expense to big genome-wide association studies, and they take a long time to perform, and there are data security issues and confidentiality, et cetera. But it sounds like uh, the approach with pluripotent cells is going to be um, a real springboard uh, for that sort of approach, complementing it and, and enabling more data and more discovery from those big data sets. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the two approaches are very much complementary and they really feed into each other. So what's the timing for this? When, when can I expect to see uh, the St. Paul's new discovery come out about uh, uh, the mechanism and the effect and the genetic variant for a lipid-lowering drug, say? 
<laughs> yeah, well, that, that's I keep asking my graduate students that same question. <laughs> um, I, you know, we've got I think some very interesting findings. We're we're still a relatively new group, as I mentioned. You know, we've I've been at this now in my own lab for uh, for three years. Um, you know, these are studies that take uh, take they take time to develop the technology to to generate the results. But but uh, you know, I think you can expect to see some interesting things uh, uh, coming coming from this uh, certainly within the next uh, six to twelve months. So Fantastic. stay tuned. <laughs> okay, I, I will hold you to that. Um, in terms of making this work go faster, because we know, you know, that, that we've got to do the science properly, it takes time. Is, is, are you getting the support you need? Is there anything that we should be, you know, putting out to the government that says, okay, is there something that, some, maybe it's equipment, maybe it's money, maybe it's resources, is there anything that would speed this process? Yeah, you know, I think I think in in, in um, I mean, so I think we're we're lucky to be where we are at UB. We've got we've got some excellent uh, resources and, and more importantly, excellent people here. And uh, and and there's uh, there's a lot of activity actually in the stem cell space, yeah. um, and that's that's just growing even more now with the School of Biomedical Engineering and other developments. Um, you know, I think. As Canadian scientists, we always face the challenge of, of limiting funding, limiting uh, uh, operating funds uh, to conduct our research, um, even with some of the modest increases to the budget of CIHR. You know, the success rates are still only, um, you know, on the order of 14%. So there's a lot of excellent proposals and excellent science that's not not being funded. So I think, um, you know, we've had the Naylor report in, in Canada that's really identified the need um, and the opportunity to increase our level of funding for for biomedical research and uh, and I really um, uh, you know I, I hope the government listens to that and yeah. and takes steps to uh, to bring the level of funding to to an adequate level because I think it's clear we're still below where we should be absolutely and I know that um, we uh, we we in Can in Canada particularly we're very good at collaborating uh, and maximizing the resources we do have available in Canada. Are you working with other groups across uh, the country at all? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, in in various areas of our research, we we collaborate quite quite broadly. Um, you know, certainly on the lipid side, we've got a very active network of of people all across the country involved in. Um, in um, uh, looking at patients with inherited lipid disorders, um, so so I think that is one of the nice things in in Canada is um, you know uh, we tend to to be uh, reasonably good I'd say at working working together as you said to to sort of maximize our our impact. So yeah, definitely something that we're looking to to continue. Absolutely fantastic talking with you. Um, uh, I I think that um, we all of us. Um, look for more resources, but uh, the fact that you've uh, been recognized by Michael Smith and uh, CIHR, I think, reflects the importance of the science that you're doing and the work that you're doing for Canadians. Um, but I'd just like to thank you very much for your time and talking to us today. Great. Well, great to chat with you, Martin, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah.